Today's scripture reading can be found in Matthew chapter 12, verse 43 to 45. And I'm reading from the New King James Version. When an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes to dry places seeking rest and finds none. And he says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it empty, swept and put in order. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. So shall it also be with this wicked generation. Let us pray, church. Father in heaven, as we open up your word together as a family, we ask your blessing upon the speaking and hearing of the word so that the individual selfish impulses of the, of the hearts of everyone gathered here, whether the preacher or the people in the, uh, in the group, might be subdued. And your name and your teachings might be exalted above all. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right, church, for the last two weeks, I've been preaching to you about what? Who pays attention to the preacher? Well, staying awake. <laughs> no, not, not quite staying awake. <laughs> What's the overall picture? Nobody pays attention to the preacher, seriously? Conversion. Thank you, my wife. Yes. <laughs> True conversion to, um, to the gospel of Jesus Christ. We've looked at what it is, why it's important, and how statistically only four and a half out of every 100 professed Christians live a true converted biblical Christianity. Um, so today I want to explore this teaching by Jesus that we just read in the scripture verse and what it tells us about the process of conversion and salvation. So let's start with a few foundational premises before we go into the, the message. Gospel of John, chapter 3, verse 3. Jesus answered and said to him, meeting uh, Nicodemus, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Is there anything confusing about that statement? One must be born again in order to go to heaven, right? Is Jesus ambiguous? One must have a true conversion to go to heaven. Therefore, is conversion important? Okay. So Jesus says that uh, being born again is a requirement. And verse 5, if we were to keep reading, uh, tells us that being born again means being born of the Spirit and living according to the Spirit. So what does living by the Spirit entail? You want my opinion? Yes. Yeah, I'll give you a good one. But is my opinion the Word of God? No, so what do we really want? The Word of God, right? We get the answers from the Bible. Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 and 17. Paul says, walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit and the Spirit against the flesh. For these are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish. Okay, so spiritual living and the lust of the flesh are contrary to one another. If you are living according to the flesh, you are not living according to the Spirit. Therefore, according to Jesus, you are not born again and you will not go to heaven. That's pretty terrible, right? So what does living according to the flesh entail? Verses 19 through 21. It entails adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like. So, in other words, those all too common impulses of the human heart are living according to the flesh. Now, some of those things might seem fairly foreign to us, like sorcery, right? Probably none of us go home and, like, practice necromancy, right? Raising the dead. But some of them are not so foreign, right? How about wrath? Selfish ambitions, those strike a little closer to home, don't they? They do, right? And so let us not focus too much on these, amen? But rather, let's see the spiritual dimension at work here. We looked last week at how the process of true conversion is negatively impacted by the so-called great controversy between God and heaven. And there's always a spiritual component to Christian living and warring against the carnal impulses. So, follow me here. I'm going to make kind of an argument to you. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 8, verse 2, we find this following thing. 
The Bible says, certain women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom had come seven demons, was one of these women. Mary Magdalene was cured of seven unclean spirits by Jesus. Are you familiar with the story in John chapter 8? This is the woman caught in adultery and brought before Jesus. The beginning of which, the summary of which, is in John 8, verses 3 and 4. The scribes and the Pharisees brought to him, Jesus, a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in his midst, they said to him, Jesus, or excuse me, teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Jesus goes on to kneel down and write the sins of the Pharisees in the dust, simultaneously calling him who is without sin to cast the first stone at this woman, and the Pharisees all slink away in shame, realizing they've been defeated by the Son of God. I believe that this woman is Mary Magdalene, even though the Bible does not say so specifically. Uh, many New Testament scholars agree with me, and here is the reason why I believe this. I believe it because Luke's description of Mary having seven demons cast from her in chapter 8 immediately follows the story of a sinful woman using expensive alabaster perfume to wash Jesus' feet in Luke chapter 7, right? So this story is immediately followed by, by the way, Mary Magdalene had seven demons cast out of her. So contextually speaking, it makes sense. They're linked. The story, if you're not familiar with it, in Luke 7, verses 37 and 38, it says, Behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, bought or brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil and stood at his feet behind him weeping. And she began to wash his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. And she kissed his feet and anointed them with the fragrant oil. She then gets in trouble with the disciples, particularly Judas Iscariot, who wanted her to sell the perfume for lots of money so he could pocket it for himself. Um... So we have strong contextual evidence that these two women are indeed the same. But it gets even stronger when we see this exact same story in John's gospel. John chapter 12, verse 3, the Bible says, Then Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard, anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. Her name is Mary! Granted, it was a fairly common name back then, but that's awfully coincidental, don't you think? Right? A sinful woman named Mary, <laughs> loving on Jesus. But it actually gets even more detailed. Right? There is a detail that Luke records in his version of this story that gives us further evidence to my claim. Luke 7, verse 47, uh, Jesus says, Therefore I say to you, her, this woman's sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. Right? So she had many sins, just like the many demons that Jesus cast from her. Um, also, she loved much because she had been forgiven much. So this was unusual. This kind of devotion to Jesus was unusual, even among his disciples, right? They all kind of sinned and fell away when the going went, got tough. She stands out. This account of the expensive perfume appears in all four Gospels. There is very little that appears in all four Gospels, right? So it's like God is trying to bring this to the forefront of our attention and make us understand this woman. Sure enough, it is Mary Magdalene who lingers at the tomb on Resurrection Sunday. It is to Mary Magdalene that Jesus first appears and gives the privilege of being the, the world's very first evangelist. John chapter 20, verses 16 through 18, Jesus said to her, Mary, she turned back to him and said, Rabbi." which is to say, teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, and to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things to her. Right. So the love between Jesus and Mary was proportional to the amount of forgiveness that she received from Jesus. And so the this, this sinful woman... Of, with the alabaster jar of perfume, has a strong, unusual devotion to Jesus. And Mary Magdalene is clearly highly prized by Jesus. And so she is most likely the same woman. And I would guess that the reason we don't have a very specific, clear-cut link between them is out of respect for her, right? Because she's, you know, sleeping with everybody in town and living a sinful life. So, like, out of respect, we don't name her by name until she undergoes the process of conversion and comes to Jesus. Um, but here's the point. Why, why does this matter? This woman is caught in adultery. 
And yet G- the Bible says that she had seven demons cast from her. So therefore, possession by unclean spirits or demons is not solely limited to these like crazy supernatural behaviors that you see elsewhere in the Bible, like in Luke 8, 27 through 29. Totally different story. When Jesus stepped out on the land, there met him, a certain man from the city who had demons for a long time. And he wore no clothes, nor did he live in a house, but in the tombs and the graveyard. For it had often seized him, and he was kept under guard, bound with chains and shackles, and he broke the bonds and was driven by the demon into the wilderness. Right? So that is clear-cut demon possession. And yet, what I'm trying to show you is that the impulse that drives us to the lusts of the flesh, the adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like can all be from demons, right? They don't have to be these, like, naked, crazy, supernatural power demons. These are demons. The seven demons that manifested in Mary Magdalene bear witness to that. So the process of getting rid of those demons out of your life is, or through the power of Christ, of course, is conversion. Right? Leaving behind one life and starting another life. It's being born again. This is the process that is required in order to get to heaven. So if everyone must be born again, then everyone has a demon or seven to lose, right? It is pretty important to get rid of your demons, is it not? But Jesus talks about this process of demon cleansing in our scripture verse that we read in Matthew 12, verses 43 through 45. He says, When an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places seeking rest and finds none. Then he says, I will return to my house from which I came, and when he comes, he finds it empty, swept, and put in order. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter and dwell there, and the last state of that man is worse than the first. So shall it also be with this wicked generation. We learn a lot from this story, so let's examine it closely. First, we see that Jesus likens your body to a house. It's very clear, right, in this verse. Uh, When an unclean spirit leaves a man, he eventually comes back to his house. So the demon lives inside of you, and we see this uh, likening of your body to a house. Paul, the Apostle Paul, uses the imagery of your body as a house in several places, and understanding this helps to clear up some of his confusing statements, like that made in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, which everybody accepts as so-called proof from the Bible that you go straight to heaven when you die as a spirit being. Um, So if you have an understanding that the Bible uses imagery of your house to liken to your body, suddenly some of those confusing things become a lot less confusing, right? So is it important to know the imagery that the Bible uses? It is, right? Um, But we also learn more. So I have a simple question for you. Who is it that drives out the evil spirits? Jesus. Jesus, right. But how do we know that? Are you guessing? Is it your opinion? Ah, yes, you're right. Yeah, he did drive out the spirits of Mary Magdalene. We also see him drive out a spirit directly in Luke 4, verses 35 and 36. Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. When the demon had thrown him in their midst, it came out of him and did not hurt him. Then they were all amazed and spoke among themselves, saying, What a word is this? For with authority and power he commands the unclean spirits, and they come out. So it's not, most people can't do this, right? It's not like any random religious person can cast a demon out. It has to be Jesus working through a person. So Jesus is the one that drives out the demons. Therefore, when, okay, therefore, when the unclean spirit goes out of a man, it means that Jesus has entered the man's life. That is the only way you get rid of an unclean spirit. Jesus represents this by saying that the man's house is swept and clean and put in order. So this means that our houses are only swept and put in order when Jesus house cleans for us. That's the only way. We can't do it ourselves because the demon is there when we try to do it ourselves. And so if you have never accepted Jesus in your life, then your house is dirty and disarrayed. 
That's what this story is telling us. How does this relate to the process of conversion? Well, let me ask you, is your life different now after accepting Jesus? I hope the answer is yes. I certainly hope so, because it should be. Your house should be swept and put in order. Prior to Jesus, your house was filthy and chaotic. If your life is the same now as it was before Christ entered it, guess what? Your house is still filthy and chaotic, right? Just because you say Jesus, Jesus all day does not actually mean you underwent a conversion. Accepting Jesus should change you. It must change you. Conversion means change. So if, again, if the only change in your life after accepting Jesus is that you use the word Jesus a bunch of times throughout the day, then that is not a true conversion. It's not. Have you ever watched the show Hoarders? or any of the, like, 12 shows that are just like hoarders. When these people who, who just collect everything under the sun, when they clean their houses, you can tell. There is a noticeable difference between the house before versus after, right? And so the house looks different, and if after church today you go home and take a serious look in your spiritual mirror you hopefully will not but might find that you maybe never experienced a true conversion. Did your life change at your baptism? Does Jesus have a broom with your name on it? Or is he standing at the locked door of your house with all of his cleaning equipment waiting to come in? If you realize that your life is in need of a divine made service, then fear not, church, because the gospel is good news. Amen? Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. No one wants Jesus to clean up your house more than Jesus. He is simply waiting for you to open the door. According to our scripture verse, where does the demon go after Jesus evicts him? Does he find a new place to live? I see some of you shaking your heads. He does not. He wanders the desert and then gets homesick for you. He misses you. And so we have to recognize we might have a guardian angel, right? Our so-called personal angel. The Bible does kind of support that. But we also have our own personal demons who love us and are homesick for us, right? We have unclean spirits that call us home. Hebrews 11:15 says, Truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. This is talking about people in context, but it applies to the unclean spirits, according to our scripture verse. They have an opportunity to come home. And so when we read the promise in Revelation 12, 17, that says the dragon or the devil was enraged with the woman or the church and went to make war with the rest of her offspring, meaning us, who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus, then we understand that the devil hates us, but we can understand a deeper dimension from our scripture verse, which is that he wants to move back home. He doesn't just hate us, he hates us because we threw him out. We foreclosed upon his residence in our lives. Um, you evicted him, but he believes he is the rightful tenant of your life. And so you must take the Bible's advice seriously and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts, as we find in Romans 13, 14. Because if you leave the door open even an inch for the devil, he is going to bust right back in. He is not a gentleman like Jesus. He doesn't knock. He kicks, right? He busts the door down. He will wreck your house to get back in if he has to. And that means total abstinence from the things that used to cause you to stumble. Whatever those are. Do you have problems with lust? Is there such a thing as just a little adultery? Just a little porn? Is there? Do you have problems with drugs? Is there such a thing as just a little cocaine? Or just a little methamphetamine? Do you have problems with lying? Is there such a thing as just a little white lie? a harmless lie. I'll just break the ninth commandment a little. 
Do you have problems with obedience? Uh Uh-oh, teenagers. Do you have problems with obedience? Is there such a thing as just a little rebellion? Ridding your life of everything that causes you to stumble is akin akin to deadbolting the demons out of your house, right? It's a triple padlock with a burglar alarm and a laser power motion sensor and a 24-hour sniper in the distance ready to take that demon out. Do you have problems with music? Do you have problems with Facebook? Do you have problems with TV? Any of these things can be idols in your life. Is there such a thing as just a little idolatry? Do you have problems with your self-image? Are you constantly trying to redefine who you are in our MySpace Facebook generation, right? It's always me, me, me. I am who I am. Well, except the problem is, for the Christian, a definition as anything other than Christian is self-idolatry. It's Satan's sin, right? I will exalt myself above the stars of the Most High. I will sit in the congregation of the North. I will be like the Most High. I, 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 me, me, me. Is there such a thing as just a little Satan worship? The devil wants to come back home to live with you, and many, many, unfortunately many Christians let him back in. Did you know that most people are madly in love with the devil and don't even realize it? What happens when the devil moves back in? Putting our scripture verse back up. What happens? He brings seven friends with him. Yeah, and they're even worse. They're more wicked than the original. And so now, because you let the devil back inside, you are stuck with eight demons instead of one. That's more than Mary Magdalene had. That's a crazy amount of demons. Right? Your cocaine problem becomes a crack cocaine problem. Your porn addiction becomes an all-consuming passion that will destroy your family. Your lying becomes systemic, automatic. You lie simply because you can. Your disobedience turns into full-on rebellion, etc. Right? Whatever your problem is, when you get seven additional demons, your problem's going to get worse. And so you end up even worse than you were before you found Jesus in the first place. Isn't that horrible? Can you imagine the horror of missing heaven? Of being on the wrong side of the heavenly walls even after you experience the love and forgiveness of Christ? What a tragedy. What an absolute horror. Why does this ever happen? It's because your house is empty. The demon comes back and there's no one in it. Could the devil move back in if Jesus was still there? Mark 3.27, Jesus says, No one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man, and then he will plunder his house. Is anyone stronger than Jesus? Jesus says of himself, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. How much is all? Right? All of the authority in the entire universe belongs to Jesus. The only way the devil can move back into your house is if Jesus isn't there anymore. That's why it is so important, by the way, to catch your brothers and sisters when they fall down. Do you know someone who's falling down right now? Are you doing anything about it? If we let them fall too far... The devil moves back in, and it becomes eight times harder to expel the demons afterward than it was originally. Sometimes we leave the door to our life unlocked, even by accident. We don't even realize it. Does the devil care that it's an accident? Doesn't. Keep that in mind. You have to safeguard your own conversion, but the Bible says you have to bear one another's burdens, and that means safeguarding each other's salvation and conversion also. It means stepping in when someone needs you and saying, I love you, God loves you, let me help you. What we have seen today is that unclean spirits, so-called, are responsible for even everyday sins. That Jesus throws the demons out, and this is the process of true conversion. 
And conversion requires a daily surrender to Jesus because without it, the demons move back in and they bring friends and reinforcement. And so today, church, I am calling you to deadbolt the door of your life against the devil by staying in constant, close communion with Christ. Do you like that? That was, that was catchy, right? Those four C's. I did that on purpose. I wanted to stick in your mind. Constant, close communion with Christ. Okay? If you see a brother or a sister falling down, you must help. If the demons move back in, his or her salvation is in peril, and he could be lost. And guess what? The Bible says it's your fault. If you could have done something about it, but you didn't, God holds you responsible. Check Ezekiel chapter 3. It's there. So when you see a need and don't address it, you may face judgment just as that person will. It is your job as a Christian to help. So keep the door to your life locked by committing every part of our lives to Christ. Not just for a few hours on the Sabbath, not just with Jesus Jesus all day long, not just with a cross necklace or Christian as your religious preference on Facebook, right? But rather by glorifying God in your thoughts, in your words, in your actions, and in your lives. I'm calling you today to something that's easy to say, but not so easy to do. In fact, it's impossible to do without God's help. And that is to live a life of total dedication to Christ. Are you willing to do that, church? Tell me amen. amen. I didn't hear you enough. Tell me amen louder. Amen. That's what I like to hear. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for caring enough about us to kick the demons out and being willing to stay there for as long as we let you. Help us, Lord, to identify the things in our life that we need to get rid of so that we may properly deadbolt the devil out and be rid of our demons once and for all. Give us your strength and wisdom because we do not have any of our own. And I pray this prayer in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, church.